Hello and welcome to our Bible class today in the book of Ecclesiastes. I'm Dale Robbins from the Eubank Church of Christ and we've been going through a workbook study of the book of Ecclesiastes and today we are in chapter 10. We're using as an outline for our study the workbook by Mike Willis on the book of Ecclesiastes and I hope you enjoy the study today and appreciate you joining us. The first question that Mike asks relative to chapter 10 he says, what does a dead fly do to the ointment? That's kind of a strange question, but when you read verse 1 of Ecclesiastes chapter 10, it makes perfect sense. Dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. So doth a little folly to him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. The point that Solomon is making here, using figurative language, of course, is that a dead fly would ruin the whole mixture. It would make the medicine at the apothecary to stink. It would certainly look this very distasteful and it would not achieve its desired effect. Well, so it is with a little corruption that ruins the life of an individual who is someone known to be of reputation in wisdom and in honor. It doesn't take much to mess things up. And so the point is that that dead fly that he's talking about are those inappropriate actions that someone might in a moment of weakness or foolishness choose to do and yet it becomes a besmirch upon their reputation for a long time to come. In question two, he says, explain the lesson from verse one. Well, the point is that a man can have much wisdom and can accomplish much good, but it can all be destroyed in a moment with one foolish action. There are many individuals who have had high regard throughout the, the uh, community or, without, or throughout the nation. Individuals may be running for public office or something else and they're known for their wisdom and, and have a great reputation and then there was one indiscretion. There was something that they did that was totally out of character. It was something totally inappropriate and suddenly their reputation is crashed. And all the good that they'd done, all the wisdom that they had shared, all of that pales into the background and the focus just remains on that dead fly, that one foolish action. So Solomon is helping us to understand how important it is for us to think before every action every day. That we choose to do the right things and that we do not soil our reputation by these actions of foolishness. In question three, he says, what does verse two teach? Let's look at it. A wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart at his left. The point that is often used in scripture is that the idea of left and right are used as descriptors of right and wrong. If you look over in Matthew uh, uh, chapter 25, when Jesus talks about the separating of the sheep from the goats, the sheep were on the right hand, the goats were on the left. And that's the imagery that Solomon is using here. A wise man's judgment is going to lead him to do what is good and to do what is right. A wise man's heart is at his right hand. But the foolish man's judgment is going to lead him into error. And that's the latter part of the verse. A fool's heart is at his left. He is going to do those things that are inappropriate. He's not going to think through his actions. In question four, how does a fool say to everyone he meets, I am a fool? Well, he doesn't do that by walking around with a sign of some sort. Notice what he says in verse three. Yea, also, when he that is a fool walketh by the way, his wisdom faileth him, and he saith to everyone that he is a fool. In other words, the individual that is given to, to foolish actions is a fool that is going to advertise his foolishness by the things that he does and by the things that he says. When he's by the way, his wisdom is going to fail him. And all you have to do is listen to the things that he says and watch the things that he does. And he's advertising his foolishness. In a question four, excuse me, uh, uh, question five, what does verse four counsel? 
in verse 4 he says if the spirit of the ruler rise up against thee leave not thy place for yielding pacifieth great offenses sometimes trying to have a positive influence and exert a positive influence is not well received and when you try to counsel somebody who is maybe disagreeing with you somebody who is angry with you the temptation is okay and just dismiss it and walk away Solomon is helping make the point that the wise man who is the counselor even to an angry king needs to be able to stand his ground if the ruler is angry with you you still stand your ground but do it with a calmness of spirit don't get contentious don't start slapping back and forth and and trading barbs and and letting it escalate into some argument of some sort but with a calm spirit continue to maintain and counsel that which is right because the point that Solomon makes here is that at the end is if you just give in you're simply pacifying and pandering to that ruler then you're going to allow him to make some kind of horrendous mistake it's going to cause even great offenses as that a lot of good people are going to get hurt so the wise man is not a coward the wise man is prudent he knows how to share his wisdom and to give wise counsel he can't make somebody else do the right thing but he might be able to get them to think to to ponder the thing a little bit more to maybe give some some thought to his actions and find another alternative that would be a far better choice in question six he says what evil did solomon see in verses five through seven let's see there is an evil which i have seen under the sun as an error which proceedeth from the ruler folly is set in great dignity and the rich sit in a low place i've seen servants upon horses and princes walking as servants upon the earth solomon makes the point that sometimes the right people are not in positions of leadership and often individuals who may be kings or rulers may appoint very unqualified men to positions of authority and when that happens trouble is sure to come Solomon says it is an evil that proceeds from faulty leadership the point that he's seeing here is that a man who has the right wisdom and knowledge he's overlooked he's the individual set in low places and set aside he didn't get his riches through foolishness and then you have the individual who is the servant who's never been in a position of leadership and now he is riding on the horse as a person of authority and those who had insight into governmental affairs or whatever they're left in the dust behind it's important that good leaders appoint qualified people to help carry out that which is good for the people and so Solomon throughout the course of this lesson is simply helping us to see applications of wisdom how to maneuver in difficult times and how wisdom will always come out on top if it is given a fair hearing we find here in uh, continuing on in what he has to say he says in verse uh, in question 7 what admonition is given in verses 8 and 9 Solomon wrote he that diggeth a pit shall fall into it and whoso breaketh a hedge a serpent shall bite him whoso removeth stone shall be hurt therewith and he that cleaveth wood shall be endangered thereby the point that Solomon's making is you have to be careful you know sometimes you do have to dig a pit there are times when you have to tear down a hedge there are times when stones have got to be moved but in all of those situations there is an element of danger and if foolishness and the lack of forethought prevails an individual can be severely injured or killed in the processes of doing that so the point that Solomon is teaching here as he relates it back to wisdom is that you need to be cautious in the work that you do 
to understand the dangers, to think about what you are doing, and thus strive to do those things that are going to be the safest course to follow. Wisdom is what gives you the guidance in that pursuit. We find in question 8, so the writer asks, what benefit does wisdom have, as it's talked about in verse 10? In verse 10, Solomon says, If the iron be blunt, and he do not whet the edge, then must he put to more strength. But wisdom is profitable to direct. In other words, wisdom helps an individual understand how to direct his labor. And as he makes good preparation, has the necessary tools, is cautious in using them. His burden is actually made much lighter. You can take a dull axe and chop and chop and chop and chop, and maybe you can beat down that tree trunk and eventually drop that tree, but you are going to work and work and work to accomplish that end. But if you just took the time to sharpen the edge of the axe, so that it could do the cutting it was designed to do, then the whole job is accomplished much quicker and without nearly the intense effort. And so Solomon is helping us understand here that the use of wisdom is not foolishness. The individual who actually stops and sharpens his ax is not wasting time. He is working prudently in the application of wisdom. In question nine, it says, what truth is taught in verse 11? Solomon said, surely the serpent will bite without enchantment, and a babbler is no better. The whole point that once again he is making is that you need to think before you act. If you're going to be working with snakes, for example, as some in that culture did, you would want to enchant the snake before handling it, or there's a good chance you're going to get bitten. There's a way to condition and somewhat enchant that snake to be able to lessen the chances of there being a problem. And that's what Solomon's getting at here. He says, if you aren't going to take those precautions, then don't be surprised if you are, if you are bitten. He said, you need to think before you speak or you simply become the babbler. And that's the comparison that he's using. If a person doesn't enchant the snake, he gets bitten. If a person doesn't think before he speaks, he soon has the reputation of just being a babbler that does not know what he's talking about. In question 10, the author asks, What attribute characterizes the words of the wise man, as found in verse 12? Solomon said, The words of a wise man's mouth are gracious, but the lips of a fool will swallow up himself. A wise man speaks graciously. He provides options. He is not going to be demanding in the sense it's got to be his way. He will couch his words with phrases like, oh, I see it this way. Do you have a better idea? And you are working to invite others to graciously participate in the decision making. But that's not the way of the fool. The fool knows it all. And he's got to have his way in everything. And that's why he says the lips of a fool will swallow up himself. He will find courses of action that are not well planned. He will destroy himself for his lack of forethought because there's just no wisdom to be found there. In question 11, the author asks, What attributes characterize the words of a foolish man? In the next couple of verses, Solomon talks about that individual who's just not very sensible in his approach to things. Beginning in verse 13, he says, The beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness, and the end of his talk is mischievous madness. A fool also is full of words. A man cannot tell what shall be, and what shall be after him, who can tell him? The labor of the foolish wearieth every one of them, because he knoweth not how to go to the city. As soon as the fool opens his mouth, he starts spouting words of foolishness. And whenever you analyze his conclusions, it is nothing but, as Solomon calls it, mischievous madness. There's no good strokes here of wisdom and forethought. That fool is just full of words. 
And the people who have to listen to that and have to put up with that are going to be weary, weary indeed. He is full of words, but he, Solomon makes the point, no one really knows all that's going to happen next. The wise man has to condition his actions on the what ifs that might occur, but the foolish man doesn't even think about that. And so he just blunders on. He doesn't know what's going to be next, and he's kind of flying by the seat of his pants. He said, this is the individual who can't even find his way into the city. He's not nearly as smart as he makes out to be. And so as we look to here the distinction between the wise and the foolish man, once again, Solomon is giving us earmarks. He's helping us to look at the actions of others. He said, you can tell a lot by the, listening to the things that they say and watching the things that they do. And you can soon tell the foolish from the wise. In question 12, the author said, Why is a land which has a child as its king cursed? Looking at verse 16, Solomon says, Woe to thee, O land, when thy king is a child and thy princes eat in the morning. Whenever you have a child as the king, there's not going to be experience and wisdom that accompanies him. He simply hasn't lived long enough to develop that. And he's usually surrounded by very self-serving associates. It's also like if the child is the king, the princes are going to be his younger kinfolk, and maybe even looking at the schedules for small children, they're more concerned with that first meal in the morning and taking care of themselves than they are anything else. And so when a land has a child as a king, there's going to be bad decisions that will be made and things that should be attended to are going to be left ignored. In question 13, he said, what temptations face rulers in verses 17 through 19? Blessed art thou, O land, when thy king is the son of nobles, and thy princes eat in due season, for strength and not for drunkenness. By much slothfulness the buildings decay, and through idleness of the hands the house droppeth through. The feast is made for laughter, and wine maketh merry, but money answereth all things. The point that Solomon makes here is that it's a good thing when you have the right people in office. He said, blessed are the land when the king is the son of nobles. He's been trained in leadership. He knows the concerns that he needs to entertain. And so he moves into, into the throne in due season with some insight under his belt. And he is an individual who understands that I'm just not here to party. He eats to gain his strength and to function. It's not all about drunkenness and reveling because I'm the king and I can do whatever I want to do. The right person involved in leadership is not going to be slothful because if he doesn't pay attention to the right things, buildings start to decay and soon the house drops through. So being self-indulgent and partying, being slothful and not conscientious about business these are the very individuals who then decide, as he says in verse 19, that money can answer all things. I'll just throw some money at this problem and somehow that'll get it fixed. He doesn't give a solution. He just throws more money at the problem. And so it is with poor leadership. They don't think about using funds wisely. They just look at the bottom line. Well, we'll give millions of dollars over there and that'll fix that. Well, if you haven't got a plan for using those millions of dollars, it will all be siphoned off through the wrong sources and the problems will only get worse. And then in question 14, he says, what danger should be avoided according to verse 20 and why? Solomon says, curse not the king, no, not in thy thought, and curse not the rich in thy bedchamber. For a bird of the air shall carry the voice and that which hath wings shall tell the matter. This is a big one, because a lot of times we do not think about the things that we say. Solomon says, do not speak critically or curse the king. And he also says, nor the rich, curse not the king, no, not in thy thought, 
and curse not the rich in thy bedchamber. There are some individuals, especially in the times in which we now live, that they simply revel in class warfare. Certain politicians are just always bad. They're always making bad decisions. They never do anything good. And all of my plight in life and every, all, all the struggles that I have are because of those rich people. And so oftentimes good politicians and even conscientious, benevolent, wealthy people are maligned and are cursed by others because of jealousy or lack of understanding. And notice what Solomon says is going to happen when you get into that vein or that habit of simply talking against the politicians, talking against the rich, talking against those that you see maybe somewhat better than yourself. He said those words are going to find their way back to the very people that you're cursing. For a bird of the air shall carry thy voice, and that which hath wings shall tell the matter. There's going to be someone who carries your story, someone who carries your words. Someone will say, well, he said so-and-so, and pretty soon you've got a lot more problems on your hand, and you will pay dearly for those things that you say. Over in Romans chapter 13, beginning in about verse 2, the Apostle Paul here is talking about the importance of our obeying the government of the land. He says, the powers that be are ordained of God. And in verse 2, he says, Whosoever therefore resists the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. He says down in verse 7, Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, and honor to whom honor. You see, the words that we speak are powerful tools. The things that we say are going to even have an impact on what may happen to us eternally. The Lord talked about the importance of our thinking about the words that we speak, realizing that we will give an account thereof of the things that, that we say. And it's important for us to put some forethought into that. In Matthew chapter 12, beginning in verse 36, Jesus said, But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. You know, it's very easy for us to think that we can just say anything we want to say, and no one's going to know. I can post anything that I want to post, and, and it's never going to get back to me that I'm the face behind those words. I'm the name that goes with those statements and, con and that content. But over in Luke chapter 12 and verse 2, Jesus said, For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. So the Bible helps us to understand that first the wise man thinks about what he's doing. As we've noticed in our lesson today, he's cautious. He stands his ground. He is not wishy-washy, but he does it with a calmness of spirit and with a reasonableness about him. He's not given to foolishness. The way of the fool is very evident to everyone around. But with forethought and deliberation, he tries to do that which is right. And he tries to be gracious with his words. He's not given to slander. He's not given to running down others because he wants to accentuate that which is good. Well, I hope you've enjoyed our study today, taken from Ecclesiastes chapter 10, and we hope that you'll be able to join us next time as we continue with our study in the book of Ecclesiastes.